Hey, this is David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscient Digital, and you're listening to The Long Game. In this episode, we hear from Ashutosh Priyadarshi. Ashutosh is the founder of Sansama, a daily planner for busy professionals that helps you plan out a focused workday by pulling together tasks from all of your tools. Ashutosh has spent most of the last decade building and launching productivity hardware and software, and his goal is to build products that help us navigate our work and life mindfully and intentionally. I found out about Ashutosh and Sansama through a newsletter two years ago, and after hearing rave reviews, I gave Sansama a shot, and within 24 hours, I became a loyal user. In this conversation, we talk about his journey of building Sansama, his decision to focus on profitability versus pure growth, an uncommon path in startups, how he thinks about building a team that's focused on deep work and async work, and how he takes the same intentionality he applies to work and applies it to his daily life habits as well. This was a really insightful conversation that got me to reflect on how I might improve my thinking about building a team and company and how I might be more intentional with my time. I think you'll really enjoy this. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Ashutosh Priyadarshan. Hey, Ashutosh, it's so great to have you on The Long Game. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, my pleasure. Excited to chat with you today. Great. So let's jump straight into it. You're the A co-founder of Sunsama. And I think after doing some research on you, the way you landed on Sunsama as a product is pretty interesting. Sounds like you went through six or seven iterations to get there. Would love to hear kind of your high level overview of how you ended up building Sunsama and how you knew that was the product to focus on. Sure. Yeah. So my co-founder, Travis, and I, we actually started this company, which is now Sensama, in early 2014, basically. And we always had this intention of building a product that would sort of allow us to be more mindful and more in control of our time. Uh, but that's such a such a broad question. And we kind of started off by just building something. Uh, and we ended up going through six or so iterations of different products that tried to answer that question. Um, we built things that were like uh, a meeting documentation tool. We built, built something that was a lot like Calendly. We built a lot of different products that were basically trying to answer this question of how, how can you be more sort of in control of, of your day and your time? Um, and the funny thing is that the product that we have today, Sinsama, as a daily planner that guides you through the process of planning your day, is a lot closer to what we had envisioned at the very beginning. But in some ways, we, I think that building what we've built now was like too ambitious to start almost. It was like, how do we get there? Um, and also, we didn't have as much intuition for how people work, how they go about their days, how they use their tools. Um, and it was through this process of like building, launching, iterating, and sunsetting all of these different products that we kind of developed a very, I think, deep intuition for how our customers think about their workday. Because um, with each of those products, we were always in this space of calendars, meetings, tasks. And so we had this chance to look at thousands of people's calendars, talk to them about how they're running their meetings, how they use Asana or Jira or whatever. And that kind of all came together at a certain point with one of the iterations of the product that we built, which was Sinsama as this sort of daily Kanban list. And <clears throat> that was the first, after we had built all of these different products, when we launched the daily Kanban version of Sinsama, it was a very s sort of simplistic product. It was like taskless on a per day basis. Mm -hmm. um, we launched it on Product Hunt and the reaction that we got to that product and the feedback that we got after afterwards from the people who were using it was very different from what we had gotten before that. I think the, the interesting things that we saw that were sort of fundamentally different is we had more customers or, and users saying things like, this is something I've been looking for for years, but nothing has done it for me. Um, I've tried building this for myself. And then the other big sort of qualitative difference was that instead of 
users saying like, I need feature X in order to use your product. They're, they were saying things like, I use this feature and I want it to do more. And so those were, that was for us sort of an indicator that like, aha, there's something here of value. And if we keep going, you know, we can build more and more value that sort of compounds on what already exists. So um, long answer to your question, but yeah, there you go. Yeah, it, it all makes sense. It's as if, even though the idea you had in the beginning, the process was necessary to build what you ended up building. One thing that's interesting is the way you described it, at least maybe one of the first iterations of a daily Kanban board, Trello already existed, Jira existed. What what do you think made Sansama special to folks when you launched? Like, Because they could have easily just used one of those other ones. Yeah, and in fact, early on what we saw was people would send us screenshots of their Trello and be like, hey, look, I have a Trello uh, board with a column for every day of the year and I move tasks mm-hmm. forward. And so what was special about Sansama at that time was that we had the integration with your calendar so you were seeing your tasks and your calendar side by side. And we also did a few small things like you could, uh, you know, uh, add your tasks to the calendar. Uh, if you didn't finish something, it would automatically roll over to the next day. And for a lot of people who had had who had built this kind of workflow in their own tools, it was like each day it was like, let's take these five tasks I didn't finish today and move them to tomorrow. And then yes. let me do that again. Um, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science to do that. It's not very hard, but it's the kind of thing that you're doing every day, day in and day out. Um, and so at a very basic level, uh, just having some of that automated and thinking more deeply about like, what is the workflow for your daily tasks? Um, and how is that different from your workflow for your project tasks that live in Trello or Asana or whatever. I think that that was for us the big um, thing about Sensama that was special. It was time-based instead of project-based. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And I wanted to go back to the the six iterations you did before this. Maybe a few questions there. One, how did you know when it was time to sunset that product and move on to the next iteration? And what kept you going through so many iterations? Yeah, so for the for your first question, there were different reasons for different products and different iterations. Uh, for example, one of the products we built, which was like a meeting documentation tool, um, a collaborative meeting documentation tool, we had gotten to the point where we had built every feature we thought we could build. and we still didn't have the engagement conversion or retention that we wanted. And we, we just thought to ourselves, it's like, I, and we've talked to customers, we've asked them what they wanted. And it was just like, well, I don't, I can't think of what else we can do here to make this like a good enough product that there's a real business here. Um, So that was one of them. One of the more interesting ones that we ran across in terms of like why we moved on was very early on, we had built something. This was probably like 2014 before like Calendly was a household name. We basically built something that was very, very similar to Calendly. Um, and we actually had paying customers, but there was just something about it where it, it didn't scratch our itch uh, that we had started with. It was like, okay, this is cool. Uh, We've built a way for you to more easily have people book times with you. That's a valuable product, as we can see. Uh, Calendly, incredibly successful company. Yeah. Um, but for us, it just felt it felt too transactional, and it was just like this small sliver of of what's going on in your day. It's like okay, we've made it easier for people to like transact time, but it wasn't really getting at that real core question that was like eating at us, which is like. For the next 40 years, potentially, we're going to be working behind a computer. Like, how can we be thoughtful and intentional about what we're going to do each day? Um, And so we ended up sunsetting that one, not because it couldn't work as a business, but it just wasn't something we were excited to work on for the next 10 years, for example. Um, Maybe financially a really stupid decision to have done that. Anyway, um, but... Uh, how did we keep going? Um, 
Well, I think part of it goes back to we always had this this itch of like how do we how do we make work a a positive force in our life instead of a destructive force, which I think often it tends to be. Um, and I think with each iteration, we always felt like, hey, we learned something new about our product, in which case we made an iteration to it. We learned something new about customers or the users or how they think about their day. And there was always this like next question. It's like, well, okay, this didn't work, but now we have this new question we want to answer or new thing we want to try. Um, let's go do it. Um, so I think that that, that always drove us. Um, and yeah, I think the funny thing now about Sensama is it's kind of reached this point where it just keeps going deeper and deeper rather than wider and wider. And so that's in terms of continuing with what we're doing now, that's, that's made it fun. It's like, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but it's like, customers are less asking for like, can you also do these other things so I can use your product? They want you to do more and more yeah. of what your product already does. And that that makes it a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember when I heard about Sinsama like two years ago, it was from a newsletter and I just pay attention to what other tools people are using. And I saw Sinsama, I think it was request only at that point. And I said, oh, this looks interesting. Let me request. And when I got accepted, I think it was twenty dollars a month. And I I wouldn't I won't even sign up for superhuman because I couldn't justify twenty dollars a month for managing my email. But I took to Twitter, I posted like, hey, has anyone used Sama curious about it? I think you chimed in and tagged some people. And everyone had nothing but great things to say about the product. And so I said, All right, I'm I'm convinced. Let me sign up. And in 24 hours, I was like, yep, I'm ready to pay for your subscription for this. I was doing manual like tasks and Todoist, opening up my calendar, creating an event in the calendar. And if I had to reschedule it, reschedule it in Todoist, reschedule my calendar. And it just seemed to be the perfect tool for me. And when I looked more into Sensama, at least from what I can tell you, you're not doing that much marketing. So how have you grown? How, how have you been getting users? Yeah, well, we do, we do do some marketing, maybe we need to do uh, do a better job so people think we're out there marketing. But yeah, for for the most part, the reality is that our best growth um, comes from word of mouth. Um, oh yeah, so, I, get, I share it with anyone I get the chance to, I yeah. screen share and everything. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a much better acquisition channel for us than uh, Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, but yeah, I think for us, one of the one of the things we've tried really hard to do is build a product that's good enough that people will spontaneously tell their friends or colleagues about um, and that's been that's been kind of interesting to see every time we've bumped up our marketing efforts whether it's you know trying a new ad channel or now we do a lot of influencer marketing um, mm -hmm. we've seen that our word of mouth uh, sort of top of funnel stays the same. So it's like when we tell more people through about Sensama through marketing channels, the people that acquires ends up telling, you know, getting more of the organic word of mouth out yeah. about Sensama, which has been, you know, really, really crucial for us because we're a small team and we're not, we're not really at the stage where we're ready to just like uh, burn cash to market and scale really fast yet. So at the end there, he said, yet. And that's an interesting note. I, I remember seeing an email from you that Sensama is profitable, which I I remember looking up from dinner and thinking, that's sick for a software company to announce that they're profitable because some are kind of in, in that uh, path of scaling and burning for, for years yeah. and for an exit. So maybe that's a, a good pivot. I'd love to hear I know you got some funding, but this idea of profitability versus the typical venture capital path of burning and scaling. Like, tell us about your decision there and why, why you decide to do that. Yeah, I think it, it comes down to a few reasons. Uh, first, everybody who works at Sensama loves doing this. Uh, so we just felt like it makes sense that our worst case scenario is that we should just keep doing this. 
Um, and yeah. this is like a product that we want to see out in the world, like regardless of, you know, what some venture capitalist decides is valuable for the world. I think even at the scale that we're at today, I think Sensama is a pot is, is a positive force in many people's lives and we'd like to keep that going. Um, so that's part of it. And then in terms of thinking about it from the business side of things, I think that in this product category, the only way to win long term is for the product to feel really, really good. Um, and I don't think that I don't think you get there by just like lighting cash on fire. Uh, I think you do it by carefully crafting a really good product. And there may be a time in the future where it's like, okay, now there's there's a chance where we can just like both scale the product and scale the marketing where maybe it's just like, okay, we figured out exactly how integrations work, how all of these things work. And now it's just like a matter of just like cranking out like an integration every month, you know? And that might be the time where we say like, okay, we need like more people working at Sensama and we're going to spend a lot more on, on marketing. Um, but yeah, we just, we really felt that the only way we can succeed in the long term is if the product is really good. And the way we're going to do that is by having a really small team that's focused on the core product um, until we're ready for that point where we feel like, yes, this can definitely scale. So. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that approach. And there's another aspect of it where you're not trying to get the largest audience or top of funnel yet, but from from an outsider's perspective, it seems like you have a very loyal audience. At least if you were looking at a sample size of N equals one, which is me, I remember when I signed up your onboarding emails, some of them were, yeah, here's how to use the product and hey, it's time to plan your day. But I got another series where it was kind of more meditations on work. like about working from home, about contemplations on work. And I share that with so many people because it's a much more refreshing and I think he mentally healthy approach to work. And it's almost like you've started pushing forward more of this narrative of work doesn't have to be crazy. You can manage it and you can also have a life and balance it out. And I'm curious what led you to decide to share those sort of philosophies it's because it seems like it's not, it seems personal. It's not about Sensama. It's more about just uh, a meditation on how we should be approaching work. Yeah, I think those those onboarding emails came about for, for a couple of reasons. One, I think that that's fundamentally what we're trying to do, which I mentioned before. It's like, we're interested in this question of how can you go about your work day in a way where you feel calmer, more focused, more in control. It's not really about doing more. Maybe doing more becomes part of that in some way as sort of a secondary effect. Um, and how is how can work be an opportunity for flourishing in your life as, a, as opposed to mm -hmm. like a destructive force, like an all consuming, you know, force. It's like, yeah, I think that that question has motivated everything we've done from the beginning. It's like, we know we have to work. So how do we make this feel good? How do we make it feel harmonious with the rest of our life? And I, so, so I think of some of those, the emails and the thoughts in those emails come out of that. And then the other, the other part of it is, I think in one of our product iterations a long time ago, we like set up like a drip campaign. Um, we followed some like, you know, online guide, like here's how you set up like a drip campaign for a SaaS product. And we yeah. did it. And then we looked at the stats and we're like, this literally doesn't do anything. Like nobody gives a shit about these, uh, these drip emails we sent. And we're like, we're following all the best practices. Um, and so we were very hesitant to add drip emails. But what we realized later is that if, if you've got a user or a customer who's sufficiently motivated uh, to have their problem solved, they're going to figure out how to use the interface of your app. Like people are using computers all day long. They can figure out how to like click around and do stuff. Um, what's, what's a more interesting question is, can you, can you motivate and inspire people to want to use your product as a solution to their pro problem? Mm -hmm. And so we focused the, those kind of onboarding emails on that front. Um, and it also has the added benefit of 
I think that if you're a person who signs up for Sinsama, maybe you don't end up upgrading after your 14 day trial and, but you read the emails, maybe that in and of itself is, is a bit of value for you because you've now thought you've read and thought a little bit more about how to work well. Um, and so I think that for us that, that just felt right that there's some there's some value being provided if you just read the that email and don't even go uh into the product yeah yeah if i were to dig into that and kind of think out loud it's almost like those emails they they treat your new users as people that who whose lives don't revolve around work and it's sort of like the elephant in the room like yeah i want to be better at work but that's not my life and like you're smart, you can figure out the product, but let's talk about this overall philosophy because you've, I imagine your users have all hit burnout at some point multiple times, yeah. are stressed out at work, have a lot to do. So you you zoom out, like let's step away from all of that and think about how we're thinking about work. And it seems like a differentiator. I mean, I I can't speak from an engineering standpoint how complex it is to build Sansama, but someone can probably figure out how to build something similar, but do they have the inherent same philosophies in it like you do and, or you and your team? Yeah, I think that, that that is something we hear a lot. I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to boil it down, like we're making like a website with checkboxes, uh, <laughs> anybody can do it. Um, so it's not, it's not rocket science in that sense. Um, but I think that what we are trying to do differently is build a tool that focuses around different ideas of work, different philosophies of work, um, while also being very practical um, in terms of like, you know, we have to use Asana, we have to use Slack. Like, yeah. okay, how do we take these like tools we have to use and how do we blend it with a larger philosophy, how we should work and really how we should live? Yeah. And uh, this is going to dig a little bit into a specific scenario, but I saw you tweeted out that a customer built a synchronization system with Things3 and Trello so they can use your Trello integration. How did that feel to see someone building on top of your stuff? Yeah, it was kind of mind blowing because I'm, <laughs> I was just like, I don't know. It's like you. You see people always out there, they're like building things on top of other products and you're like, oh, they're, you, yeah. you know, they're building like X on top of Zapier on top of this. And you're like, oh, that's cool. Uh, those, those must be like real companies where they have like <laughs> customers. And I'm like, oh, now people, I don't know. It's, it's weird to, it's just weird to think that somebody would put that much effort in. Um, and I don't know, for me, it just gave me a sense like, oh yeah, like this product is really important to some of our customers um and yeah I, I think that that's what i i realized and you know i think as a as a startup founder you're always just like oh like things aren't good enough like we need to make the product yeah. better we need to you know, we need to market better we need to do all of these things and then to step back and realize like oh for some people like what we've built is already really valuable um so yeah i don't know a lot of mixed mixed feelings, yeah. uh, surprise. It's, it's a big moment. I mean, yeah, you look at Airtable, Notion, Zapier, people are building a bunch of these things on those platforms. And I mean, it's a cool leading indicator to see how someone's building on yours. So, I mean, maybe there's a platform play, but that's going into, maybe, yeah. maybe that's my next question. Like, where do you see Sansama going in the future? And maybe if you want to put an arbitrary time frame on it, five years or something. Yeah, it's funny because if you asked me that question like three years ago, I had all of these ideas, like right when we went through YC, like, you know, we were thinking about like, okay, we're going to do this. And then we have all these like big visions that we're going to do next yeah. after that. And the funny thing is the more and more like the product has caught on with customers and we have, you know, loyal, happy paying customers. I, I have no time to to think about that it's just like we just keep building what people ask for or based on the problems that we see that they have when we do customer calls building that and so the honest truth is i think that our our vision for now is just keep building what our customers want and i think that the product will just 
the vision kind of takes care of itself in in that sense. Um, I think to give you a, an answer, though, I would say we've always thought of Sensama as kind of your primary interface for your workday. So it's like it's the place you log in in the morning and just feel like, hey, like I can run my whole day out of this product. Um, so that's kind of a hazy idea of a, of a long-term vision, but the more and more we work on it, the more and more I feel like that's that question ends up being a distraction. And the more important question is just like, what are customers doing with the product? What do they want? Um, and what problems do they have? And if we just keep repeating that cycle, it seems like the vision takes care of itself. I appreciate that answer a lot. And I can tell you, I think you are uh, definitely achieving that goal of being the interface for the workday. I have it open. I have two monitors and it's uh, on my other screen on the today view. And I'm like, okay, this is taking longer than I expected. Let me move some things around. Ah, great. Let me push this thing to the next day. Easy to do that instead of having to deal with a bunch of other tools. So keep doing what y'all are doing. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, we will. Uh, yeah. And, you know, even when you tell me that, I'm like, oh, like, oh, you have to like, move things manually it's like i really want to make it so that you know <laughs> if you run over time like you can move things like together and quickly just automatically so. like push everything or something yeah so yeah. um yeah that's I, I think that's what i'm talking about it's just like there's there's just so much to do without a grand vision um so yeah and from what i can tell your team is completely distributed or remote uh, i'm not sure which phrase people tend to use but how do you build like maintain momentum with all these things you're building while maintaining that remote culture and yeah, like what, so, what does async work look like and so on yeah so our team is fully remote and fully async we're seven people uh pretty much across the planet we've got someone in india we're uk portugal uh i'm here in the bay area and then my co-founders in alaska and then we have someone in nevada so we're like really stretching across the globe. Uh, but async work, I think, is amazing for the type of product and business that we're building, which is extremely product focused. Uh, in order to build product, you need to just like sit down quietly and often write code. Uh, and async just provides so much space for that, uh, which I think is amazing. It's like every day for the engineers on our team is like a full deep work day because there's no meetings. Um, that sounds so, amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really great. Um, uh, it's really only me that has to do like other obligations, um, as the person who sort of interfaces with the outside world. Um, but yeah, in terms of maintaining momentum, we have, we just kind of have a set of like daily and weekly and even yearly rituals that we go through that kind of keep us on track. So I'll, I'll go into the nitty gritty um, yeah. in case you're curious, but basically each day we're all planning our days with Sensama um, and whatever we have plan like to a, do that day. Do you have like a time when everyone's online at the same time doing it or? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, okay. Because we're, we're all in different basically, time zones. Yeah. So, People plan their day whenever they, I don't know, whenever they decide right. to plan their day in the morning uh, and they post to Slack what they're planning to work on that day. Um, so that's just kind of interesting to see like, you know, whatever uh, Bruno in Portugal is doing whatever X today. And then at the end of the day, we use Sensamba's reflect feature to basically say like, here's what we got done. And that's typically where we'll do things like you know, include a link to a PR, uh, include a link to a Notion document, maybe um, a Loom video of like the progress we made on a feature we're building, or for example, our head of growth, he'll post links to the social profiles of all of the new ambassadors that um, joined our ambassador program that, that day. Um, so it just gives a sense of like, okay, here's the things that are happening and we can all keep a, keep a pulse on that. Um, and then at the end of the week, we do our like weekly one-on-ones as well uh, uh, asynchronously. So each person on the team writes kind of a short review of what they got done that week, you know, their challenges, uh, as well as things that went well. 
and then somebody, either me or Travis, will kind of respond to those, give feedback, and we'll also talk about like what their priorities should be for, for the next week. And then the last bit of kind of procedural stuff that we do is each week I write a weekly update for the team uh, that includes a lot of our key metrics and KPIs at the top. And then after that, we just do like a short summary of here's what we shipped, here's what we built, um, here's, here are the projects that are in progress, uh, as well as like what are the big problems we need to solve next week. And that's kind of, that kind of keeps us on track to make sure that we're, you know, working towards our metrics and everybody knows what everyone else is working on. So long answer to your question, uh, but those are kind of the, the things that we do. I love that. I'm taking some notes of things I'd like to try out. And Good news for you. I have a whole blog post that explains all of it in detail. So I'll, I'll send amazing. that to you. Amazing. That would be great. And I'm making an assumption here, but it sounds like the team's philosophy towards work is very similar to each other. And there isn't much, I guess, enforcement needed for some of these practices. It's just part of the how folks prefer to work anyway. Yeah. I mean, everybody on the team is pretty bought into like remote async deep work um and it's not i i like to think that our process isn't that onerous um you know and it's like the trade-off is you have to spend 20 minutes a week writing an update about what you did that week um which is still better than like a one hour one-on-one -on -one with with your manager yeah. you know yeah. like which most people are doing or often people are doing so it's like the trade-off is is still pretty good. Um, I think that's one of the things you run into with async work. It's like you have to write a lot. You have to type a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just like show up and run your mouth, uh, which is often easier. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think I think overall it's it's a better trade-off. You know, no meetings. Um, and actually, I lied. We do have one meeting a week on Mondays, but we don't talk about work. We only talk about what we did that weekend. Um, so it's just like oh, a chance cool. to have some some human interaction time with our with our colleagues. Yeah. How do you? So my team, we have someone based in Thailand, someone based in India, someone in Nevada, Colorado, Texas, Chicago, and I'm in Boston. So many different time zones as well. And one of the things on my mind is building kind of the team camaraderie, because I think knowing each other as part of work is great. It feels like sometimes with the remote work, a lot of interactions feel a bit transactional. Yeah. How do you think about building that sort of culture and camaraderie with, with your team? Yeah, so on the, on the practical side, we do a couple of things. Like we have that call where it's like, we just don't talk about work and we just, you know, talk about what we did with our families or books we're reading or whatever, just like hang out. Um, so I think that that's helpful. We also have like a group chat that is just not work focused, you know, it's memes and pictures and just kind of fun stuff, um, which also allows us to not like flood Slack with stuff and keep work more async. Um, but I think one of the things for us is that I think we've been able to build like a camaraderie about a different way to work in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. Um, and I think that that in a lot of ways makes it not transactional. Um, and I think everybody on the team is, is motivated by building and having the time and space to build high quality things. Um, and so, yeah, we don't get to, you know, collaborate that much like in a room on a whiteboard, but it's not like we're not collaborating. It's like, I still am leaving a bunch of comments on every Loom video. I'm leaving ideas on PRs, you know, there's still a lot of collaboration happening. And um, yeah, so in a lot of ways, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like there's a, a lack of that human element. It's just, it's just different. Um, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I appreciate that. Just it's this core philosophy that folks are um, united by. Yeah, and I, I, th I think that people forget how powerful the written word is at 
communicating feelings, ideas, whatever. You know, you look at the history of the world, there's been plenty of books that were written that changed the course of history. Like the written word is still a powerful way to connect with other humans. Um, so just because you're not getting like face-to-face time doesn't mean there isn't still that that feeling of like we're we're in this together yeah that's a great reminder so we've spoken mostly about work um tell us about how you kind of structure your life you mentioned in uh in our emails together that you kind of also try to build habits for non-work things like sleep and exercise and diet and meditation how do you think about that like do you have a five thousand dollar mattress uh to help with your sleeping or how do you think about keeping those habits? Uh, unfortunately, I do not have a, a $5,000 <laughs> mattress. Um, but I think one of the things I've thought a lot about is just like how important so many of the basics are. Like, you know, sleeping, exercising, eating well. And for me, my biggest, uh, if you want to call it a, a hack, is to just sleep until I'm done. Um, that's worked really well for me. Um, I've always, I've always struggled to be a person who like wakes up on time is like ready to go early in the morning. And for me, the simplest fix to all of my sleeping woes was just like, I sleep until I'm done early on. That was like problematic. It's like, Oh, you're like sleeping (laughs) like 10 hours. Like that's a lot of sleep. But over time, as I've done that for a while, it's like, now I just, you know, I still sleep a lot. I sleep like eight and a half hours, but like how much you're supposed to get. (laughs) Yeah. But it's like the rest of the day just feels amazing. Like I don't feel, I don't feel groggy. I don't feel tired. I don't feel like, Ooh, I need a nap after lunch. I'm just like, I just feel great. And then I go to sleep. Uh, so that, that's something that's, that's worked really well for me, but it took me years, like 10 years to get to that point of just like figuring out sleep. Um, I think that a lot of these things, even even things like a, a meditation habit, it took me years and years to actually get into like a sustainable routine after like trying and failing and trying and failing. Um, so I think that it's just made, I don't know, it seems like the story of all of the things I've done is just like, <laughs> <laughs> like years of failure before like something clicks. Um, so maybe I'm just kind of generally, uh, I start off as a failure, but, um, got to start yeah, somewhere. Think, yeah. But I think that it's, I think it's helpful perspective for people who are trying, trying to add those new habits, like whether it's, you know, being better about how you plan your day or how you sleep or your meditation or exercise or whatever. It's like, it's very hard to just like make that, make a switch into good habits overnight or in a month or anything like that. I think it just takes, it takes years sometimes. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. I think we hear that a lot when, you know, someone's trying to be on a diet, they have a bad day. Oh crap. This ruined my diet streak or I can't, I can't meditate for very long, but it's just part of the process. Um, I have a similar experience with meditation or even like sleep where I'm just, sometimes I don't get good sleep and I have my Garmin watch tracking my sleep and I'll be like, oh, it ruined my streak of good sleep. But it's just yeah. like, you know what? It's fine. You had, you stayed up a little bit late one night, just, you know, go to sleep earlier next time so you don't feel this way again. And it's super basic, but it feels like maybe with our personalities, there's always room for improvement. But yeah. um, I think I saw a tweet the other day and I was like, you know, instead of trying to do all these productivity hack optimizations let's just get a good night's rest yeah honestly i feel like that's it's so much more valuable than like i don't know i think sleep is probably the most foundational thing you can do but for some reason like everybody's out there like sleeping six hours a night which is just i mean some people can function on that but like for me if i get six hours i feel terrible the next day um, yeah. So I don't know. Sleep. I mean, sleep a lot. It's great. Yeah. I look back at my college days. I, I don't know what your college experience was, but I, I had a party stage and I, you know, 
have a couple of drinks, go to sleep really late, wake up for my 8 a.m. chemistry class and be falling asleep in class. Like, first of all, why? And second of all, how did I even go off on like two, three, four hours of sleep a night? <laughs> I think about that a lot. I think about how did I, what was I doing? Like, how did I, how did I even pass these class? Actually, you know, I had an 8 a.m. chemistry where I, uh, I took the, the final exam and I looked at the questions and I was like, I've never even heard of these words. Like I was a really good student <laughs> academically, typically. And I was just like, how did I never hear of these? And it turns out that it was an 8 a.m. class and I was asleep all the time. So that's yeah. why I, I had to yeah. it. I had a 8 a.m. physics class and I'm like, this was a horrible idea. I should have chosen the 11 a.m. one. <laughs> There's no way yeah, I was going to be awake for that. <laughs> they shouldn't allow people to have classes that early. It's yeah. It's crazy. Like now, if somebody was like, hey, let's have an 8 a.m. meeting, I'd be like, no. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. My my big thing is uh, like sleep as much as you can. It's it's amazing. Um, yeah. So maybe one last thing before we, we close. Um, you referenced this blog post by Paul Graham about life is too short and cutting bullshit out of our lives. So. What sort of bullshit have you cut out? Uh, well, one of the big, big ones I feel that I've cut out is is meetings. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's been big, big for me. Just being able to to do the work that I want to do instead of talking about the work. Um, I think that that's from a work perspective the biggest thing that we've done, um, and then just like cutting out any sort of, I, I don't know what you would even call it, just like the meetings that like with other people outside of the company that would have like, ooh, maybe this will pan out. And just like, just like cutting all of that out, like not talking to investors who reach out, like not talking to- Those networking calls. Yeah, those like networking calls where it's like, ooh, something could happen. It's just yeah. like, Maybe I'm gonna miss out on something, but it just feels better to to not do speculative stuff and just like you know when a customer is like, hey, like here's something I need, like okay, let me do. I'd rather spend my time on something that I know adds value than something that could maybe possibly add value in ten years or something. I don't know. Yeah. So for me, it's like I think the big the big thing I've cut out is is those those meetings and. Um, that's been really valuable for me. Yeah, that all of a sudden gives you so much time back. Yeah, and I think even more than the time that it gives you back is the, for me, it's the energy that it gives me back. It's like if I have like three meetings in a day, I just, you know, it might only take up an hour and a half, you know, a few half hour meetings, but it feels like it takes up like four hours of, of energy from me. And I'm, I'm actually a very extroverted person generally. Um, so it's, it's not really that it's just like talking, talking is actually very exhausting. I find like at a physical level. Yeah. Well, thank you like, for making an effort to talk. Oh yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I notice because I don't, I don't have like a lot of meetings that often like when I do have meetings, it's like, oh, like I'm sweating. I don't, maybe <laughs> something's wrong with me, but you know, you're like on with another person. Like you're trying to, you know, you know, pay attention, be there, like all of these things. And it's like, oh, this is actually, you know, it's, it's a bit draining from a physical yeah. standpoint. Yeah. I'm relatively introverted. So I actually need to like mentally prep before a meeting. So that's, it's not just a 30 minute meeting. It's 10 to 15 minutes beforehand, remembering what I'm supposed to talk about and mentally preparing to have a conversation. Um, took 30 minutes before this call. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So cutting out meetings. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with that. So uh, if, if you have some more time, I got a couple more sure. quicker questions to, to wrap us up. So what's opinion you have about work or business that people would disagree with? This might be an easy one. There's so many. Uh, I think one thing that really is a uh, uh, let me let me think of what I want to say here. List them all out if you'd like. This is this seems like a 
hot topic for you. All right, well, I'll start with one that I think is fairly obvious based on what I've said so far, but I think that trying to do more or getting more done each day or each hour is a really bad way to think about productivity. And I think that it tends to be something that we've caught on to as part of like our like sort of industrial revolution notions of productivity, which is like, how do we like process more widgets per hour in a factory? And mm -hmm. I just don't think that that's how humans function. We're not machines. And there's a lot of, there's like a lot of danger in trying to like think of a human being as a, as a machine or a factory. Yeah. Um, so for me, like that stance on productivity and products that are focused on here's how we do whatever in half the time or what, what have you is I think not, not the right approach to, to productivity. So that, that for me is, is the big one. Um, but I don't know if it's, if it's that, you know, controversial, um, anymore. It's, it's becoming more, it's becoming more mainstream, I think, to, to think that way. Um, what else? Well, can you, can you tell me your question again, how you phrased it? Yeah. What's an opinion you have about work or business that people would disagree with? Okay. Um, I think the other opinion I have is that uh, you really, how do I phrase this? You don't need, you don't need managers and you don't need a lot of process, um, but that only works if you hire the right people who don't need that kind of work. Um, like we don't have, like at Tenzama, we don't have any like sprint planning or any of that uh, and it's worked great. Um, so I think that a lot of processes is, is really just bullshit and you don't, you really honestly don't need it. Uh, but you have to have the kind of people who can, who can see through that bullshit and survive without like the guardrails. Um, yeah. You're, you're speaking to a guy who has a business with SOPs and workflow documentation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that I should clarify that I don't think it's bad. I just think it's not necessary yeah. under certain oh, no, don't, circumstances. Don't walk it back at all. I, I think that's <laughs> great. I think that's a great opinion. And it, we would, I think a lot of that comes with trust too, right? Is trust your, your team members and employees to do the work that you brought them on to do and that they're motivated. Yeah. Um, um, that's awesome. Here, uh, another one is I think Slack is worse than email. I would rather just live in a world with only email. Uh, that's just me. Uh, I agree. I just met uh, a, a client who I said, oh, okay, I'll send a follow up email after this conversation just to, with next steps. And they said, oh, can you send that in Slack? We do everything in Slack. And I'm like, oh, that's well, that's cool. That must be, there must be a lot of anxiety for everyone with red dot notifications. Yeah. It's like, it's a real pet peeve of mine when I use like a new product or something. And then they're like, oh yeah, you can send us more feedback. Here's like a shared Slack channel. And now I have like all these shared Slack channels. And I'm just like, ah, oh, like I email, I like message you once a week or something. If that, like I could just send you an email, yeah. but anyway, whatever. That's, you know, my problem. Yeah. So maybe related to that, what's something you've changed your mind about recently? <sighs> something I've changed my mind about. Here's, we're going to find out how inflexible I am in my thinking now. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I would need more time. You to can pass. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'll a pass. tough one. So maybe, maybe it's something that's come through your, your process of building Sinsamba, but what is not the most, but when it's, what's one of, uh, one impactful piece of advice you've been given? I think on the the product side, it's been to the person who shared this with us was our, our YC partner, Michael Seibel. And mm -hmm. he always thought, he always explained like your onboarding and um, like sort of your top of funnel as instead of like trying to make the wall to get into your product lower and lower, is to make it higher and higher. Um, mm. That was the analogy he used. And the reason for that is that like the people who are willing to like leap over that wall, whether it's higher price or 
like a more stringent qualification flow or whatever tend to be people that you really want as your customers. And I think that that's, that's fairly counterintuitive, right? It's like you should typically you're thinking about like, oh, how do I make my product more accessible? How do I make it easier to get into? Um, and so thinking about how do you attract the right customers, the way you do that is by oftentimes filtering out the ones that would not be good customers. Um, and that means sometimes doing things like raising your prices, um, being stricter with qualification, et cetera. And I think that that Doing that was one of the things we did very early on with Sansama that has like fundamentally changed our, our trajectory. Um, yeah, it's it goes counter to a lot of the best practices you hear about reducing friction and making things easier to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it's the case with so many of the best practices. It's like... <laughs> I was telling you about how I, you know, I implemented like best practice onboarding emails. This just, just didn't work. Um, yeah. So a lot of times you have to, you have to like step back and think about like, okay, what is the purpose of an onboarding email? What is the purpose of pricing and answer those questions for yourself and for your business mm -hmm. and then go from there. Yeah. All right. So next question. Um, we're almost done here. I took a look at your Goodreads. And so I, I think we have a couple books in common. I don't know how up to date you have this is. I think the last super not ago. up to date. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, I see Man's Search for Meaning. I love that book. I know some people have some uh, opinions against that book. Atomic Habits. Um, maybe what's one book that has had a big impact on you or more if you'd like? Um, actually, I'm glad you mentioned man's search for meaning i read that i think like a few a few weeks before the the first lockdowns mm. if i remember correctly and i just felt like i don't know why but having read that right before everything in our lives changed my life as well it just felt like it gave me a lot of perspective and i kept I kept thinking about the things that I had read in that book when things were weird or difficult or challenging. And I, I felt that that gave me a lot of perspective. Um, so I, I often think about how lucky I was to have read that book right at the time that I did. Um, and there were a couple other books I was reading around that time. Um, I've, well, I'm still reading a lot of uh, Montaigne's essays. Mm -hmm which I think are, are really interesting. I'm, I'm about halfway through all of his essays, um, but you can find smaller volumes with just like a few of the like more popular ones. And I thought that those were, those were particularly interesting. Um, what I love about them is he's just like a guy who doesn't appear to, he doesn't try to be too smart. He just like says what he feels. Um, and so he's very, he's very much just like us, not like a, like an annoying philosopher. Um, so I really appreciate that. And he's always like weaving in um, stories and whatnot from like Greek and Roman, both myth mythology and history. And I find that really, really fascinating. And it's just a good, good example of how, how little the human condition itself has changed uh, throughout human history. Yeah. I appreciate that. I have not read any of Montaigne, but Perhaps I'll pick up a volume after this. I'm looking for for the next book right now. Yeah, it's a there's there's some smaller volumes with just like a few of the essays. I I highly recommend those. They're they're pretty easy to read, um, but yeah, they're they're really they're interesting. Yeah. All right. So last question here: Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, Ashutosh at sansama dot com. A s h u t o s h at uh, S U N S A M A dot com. Um, and then, you know, if you want to check out Sansama, Sansama.com. Yeah, we'll definitely leave links uh, to your profiles and Sansama for sure. Ashutosh, it was great to have you on a on a episode today. Yeah, great chatting and uh, thanks for the interesting questions.